Uma, clinical director and founder of Chef Clinic, the healthy eating and fitness program to prevent and treat obesity, maintain weight loss, and measurably promote wellness. Uh, John is a professionally trained chef, organic farmer, and a two-time New York Times bestselling author on healthy aging, nutrition, and wellness. Dr. Lapuma speaks on diet, health, stress management, healthy aging, nature therapy, and culinary medicine, and has led clinical trials of nutritional interventions designed to improve obesity, hypertension, osteoarthritis, insomnia, and diabetes. Dr. Lapuma also co-taught the first nutrition and cooking course at a U.S. medical school. Additionally, he co-hosts Lifetime TV's Health Corner and hosts PBS's Chef MD Shorts and PBS specials on diet and fitness. He's also served for many years on the board of the Food Bank of Santa Barbara. Today, Dr. Lapuma will give a talk entitled Plants, Entrees, and Autonomy, Make Yourself Happier with How You Live. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. John Lapuma. Thank you, everybody, for staying on Friday afternoon. Um, um, this is a, a departure for me as well, um, although from my bio that you just heard, I'm sure you're wondering how I got into ethics and what it has to do with this. So I hope to, um, I hope to show you that. Um, and uh, Lainey, thank you for the introduction. And Mark, thank you for the invitation. It's always a privilege to be here. Um, I have some conflicts of interest, uh, unlike um, Sophie. I have, um, among other things, the uh, TV shows and uh, farm that you just heard about. And of course, um, I wrote these four books, and I get royalties when they're sold, so I hope you buy them. <laughs> um, this is why we are here. Do you find yourself longing for the apocalypse? I did. I was looking for a reason to live. Hi, are you feeling tired, irritable, stressed out? Well, you might consider nature. From the people that brought you getting outside comes prescription strength nature, a non-harmful medication shown to relieve the crippling symptoms of modern life. Nature's recommended for humans of all ages, and it's great for pets too. Nature can reduce cynicism, meaninglessness, anal retentiveness, and murderous rage. In clinical studies, nature is proven to decrease work-induced catatonia. Caution, nature may cause you to slow down, quit your job, or seriously consider what the f you're doing with your life. If you are overly cynical, jaded, or emotionally numb, you may need to increase your dose of nature. Do you have trouble being even mildly uncomfortable? Nature may not be right for you. Side effects may include spontaneous euphoria, taking yourself less seriously, and being in a good mood for no apparent reason. So ask your doctor if nature is right for you. I wish I could take credit for producing that, or um, I only just discovered it on the web. There's a marketing firm in Colorado um, that believes that uh, this is a mission for them, and they have a number of other productions called Nature RX. You can find them on YouTube. Um, here are three parts today. The first is um, a little bit about why we don't get into nature and nature deficit and climate change. The second is how nature might be able to heal in new ways. And the third is how you might be able to participate in that directly, both for yourself and for your patients. Um, who's heard of nature deficit disorder? One, two, three, four, five. Maybe 10% of us, if that. Um, nature deficit disorder is a thing. It's uh, so little time outdoors that cognitive, behavioral, and social problems result. It's a description of, a, of this kind of problem, a cognitive, behavioral, and social problem by Richard Louvre, who's a journalist who described it in 2005. His, first book about this was called Last Child in the Woods. Um, he found that it reduces attention and the use of the senses and increases vulnerability to negative moods. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what causes it more specifically. But he specifically declined to define it as a clinical problem um, because he felt he wasn't qualified and because he wanted to gather people who were interested in these other aspects. However, I think it actually is a clinical problem 
And moreover, I think it's a clinical ethical problem, and I want to tell you a little bit about it and why I think you might want to be able to participate in it and study it. Um, one way to, to think about this is that um, the EPA has cataloged um, in a 10,000 person study um, how much time we spend inside and outside, and actually 87% of our adult life in America is spent indoors, plus 6% in the car. If you live in Chicago or Los Angeles, it's probably more like 8%. But that's a heck of a lot. 93% of our time is spent indoors. That seems out of balance to me. And I think it has clinical and clinical ethical effects. Um, what underlies nature deficit disorder, uh, Liv argued, are these three things, electronic excess. And anybody who has children or is around children knows that it's hard to get them off a screen. Um, kids under the age of, age of eight spend a, a little under two hours looking at a screen. Uh, teens, almost eight hours. Um, and 11 hours for adults. On average, we look at a screen uh, 77 times a day. That too seems out of balance to me and of course distracts us from what might be outside. Uh, the second argument he made was that we have urbanization without greening and happily Chicago, at least in pockets, is a big exception to that. Although in other pockets, it's not an exception at all. Um, we are increasingly an urban society, one that, um, that is building um, more and more urban spaces without the benefit of trees or tree cover. And then thirdly, and, and not having that, we miss a connection to nature. We forget that there's more than urban canyons. Um, and then third, we have an increased awareness of, and especially as of our politics have become more divisive and hostile, um, stranger danger. It's one thing, of course, for um, kids to go out and play like I did when I was a, a little kid on a street. Now when that happens, mom is worried, dad is worried, the, ki the man across the street might be evil, don't go over there. That kind of suspect uh, behavior or a suspected behavior of the part of the unknown people um, keeps us away from nature as well. There's also the fear of bugs. Um, that sounds funny, but in fact, a third of us give this as our primary reason for not going outside. We have crazy work hours. Everybody in this room knows what those are like. And of course, we have climate change, which Lori really lovely uh, demonstrated the notion that uh, climate change is not only real, but has infectious disease effects. In fact, it has dramatic effects in uh, many different kinds of healthcare problems. And it's increased frequency and severity of extreme events, including in my home of Southern California today, um, has uh, really dramatic ways of, of making people fearful of nature. And of course, nature itself is a double-edged sword. It happens to affect the most vulnerable people the most because they're least likely to be able to create an adaptive response um, from uh, their own homes and to escape um, floods and, and fires as well. So why do adults with nature deficit disorder, and I think that constitutes many of us actually, um, need nature therapy? What could nature therapy provide and what is nature therapy? I think it's because uh, nature deficit disorder contributes as an unnamed factor to these two factors on the slide. First, that most of us are overweight or obese and have associated chronic diseases. Um, and that can range from causes like air pollution, which uh, increases probably responsible for about 30% of stroke because environmental air pollutants, the particularly particulate matter that is 2.5 microns or less, causes accelerated atherosclerosis. Um, uh, and has, uh, and the second group of uh, conditions that nature deficit disorder promotes are um, psychological ones, not just uh, ADHD, but anxiety and depression. And this goes as often an unnamed um, kind of therapy for patients who um, are, are extremely anxious and yet might benefit from something that takes them completely out of their head, as it were. Uh, I'm not the only one who thinks this. Um, Howard Frumpkin at, his, at the University of Washington created this excellent paper called Nature, Contact, and Human Health, a research agenda published uh, in 2017 in Environmental Health Perspectives. Uh, Dr. Frumpkin has just moved on from the University of Washington, which just received a grant from REI to create a nature center for human health of a million dollars. Um, but many of these researchers are still there. 
they cataloged 143 different conditions that um, both physical and psychological that had been studied in the medical literature for um, the effects of, on those conditions from a nature environment or natural environment, whether they are blue, which is water, or green, which is landscape. Um, so that's the end of part one. Here's part two, which is how nature can heal in new ways. Um, I think nature therapy, and these are my definitions and uh, mission and vision, is the prescriptive evidence-based use of natural settings. Um, I think its mission is to prevent and improve signs and symptoms, so I think of it as a clinical intervention, uh, much like clinical ethics consultation, for example, uh, and clinical conditions, and improve well-being, which I think actually is the general purpose of medicine. And then thirdly, um, it ought to be available to every family, regardless of proximity to blue or green space. And as I alluded to, it's the underprivileged who live in urban environments, particularly in inner cities, who are unable to access nature and suffer uh, uh, disproportionately. Um, there are eight specialty fields at least in nature therapy, like many new fields or relatively new fields. It is um, somewhat fractionated. Uh, ecotherapy is around the uh, notion of psychotherapy. Um, green exercise is outside. Animal assisted therapy is dogs and llamas and cats. The cat salon in Santa Barbara is very busy. Um, there, but everybody knows that dogs actually provide, provide unconditional love, not just for those in assisted living, um, but uh, also for those with chronic conditions. Uh, and there is some data, although it's mixed, to back that up. Forest bathing has become a popular term. Who's heard of forest bathing? Only also about 15% of this. Forest bathing is the, um, Im the immersion of your senses in a natural setting. It has nothing to do with water or even with forests. It's the idea that if you sit quietly in a natural setting, a forest, a meadow, um, uh, without sounds of cars or anything else, and use your senses to one by one to get in touch with what you're hearing and seeing and touching, you can reset your brain so that you can feel and, um, and, and be more of yourself. And um, the studies of this have been, which have largely been done in Japan, and there are about 30 peer reviewed studies, show that the um, uh, a dramatic change in natural killer cells, a, a lowering of cortisol levels that are salivary, blood pressure and pulse, a reduced rate of cardiovascular disease, and a reduced rate of stroke, primarily among Japanese executives who, as you know, are in, under high stress conditions often. The same is true in Seoul, Korea, um, which has also uh, invested serious money in merging its forest system with its healthcare system. Um, there's wilderness immersion, which many people are familiar with. I recently read a study of um, uh, bouldering, which is an in-store in rock climbing to, re to treat uh, moderate depression um, versus standard SSRI treatment uh, over eight weeks, a three-hour treatment, uh, not three hours uh, a week, but three hours total, uh, which showed um, statistically significant improvement. And then there are care farms which I'm going to let Rachel Bragg tell you The evidence about. base shows us um, uh, that contact with nature um, in any way, shape or form has a, a multiple effect on, on health and well-being. Um, things like helping to protect you from future stresses, it helps you to recover from any stresses you're suffering from at the moment, uh, it helps people concentrate more, and research that we've done at Essex shows improvement to mood and self-esteem for people taking part in um, sort of nature-based activities. There's evidence specifically on care farming uh, that's starting to show uh, all sorts of things um, added as well. So it's not just the contact of na with nature, but there's the farmed environment that, that all of these activities take place in that adds another dimension to health and well-being. And also in terms of reintegrating people into society. And it's an ability for people to take part in something that really is meaningful. Um, and they're helping to nurture very often rather than being nurtured themselves. And for a lot of people, that's a completely new, new experience. Um, 
There's been a lot of public health work about nature therapy. This was a, uh, from JAMA in July, showing that cleaning up lots in Philadelphia reduces uh, symptoms of depression that are self-reported, uh, as well as uh, other mental health problems. Here in Chicago, which surprisingly, perhaps to some of you, but uh, amazingly and really wonderfully, is a leader in this uh, area. Ming Kuo at the University of Illinois showed that the uh, cover trees in Chicago public schools um, that uh, were the greatest in surface area helped to improve standardized tests of math by children independent of poverty and minority status. Um, she's also largely responsible for the $10 million plant a tree initiative here in Chicago and did pioneering work with the Robert Taylor homes in improving uh, crime rate by planting trees. Um, this is a Green Heart project. I heard somebody from Louisville here in Louisville, which is a $14.5 million five-year project to, pl to plant uh, uh, thousands of trees in a 22-square-block uh, area of Louisville to reduce cardiovascular disease. Uh, Aruni Bhatnagar, who is a senior professor of cardiology and a scholar, uh, believes that they may be more effective than statins in absorbing parts of ozone and air pollution. Um, to reduce risk for cardiovascular disease. Amazon has, um, has a half block long biosphere, which invested $4 billion in in Seattle to try to uh, increase creativity and productivity among its workers. There are no cubicles or desks. There are only 40,000 plants and uh, pathways for it and natural light, which actually improves ethical behavior. Um, as does uh, the creative boosts and collaboration and relaxation of these plants. This is a rooftop garden I designed with my colleagues at MBBJ, which is the landscape architecture firm that designed the Amazon Gardens um, biospheres. And this is a sketch of the children's garden, the cardiovascular garden, and the immunity garden that we designed together. I helped them choose the plants, and they helped uh, choose the layout for Loma Linda University. Uh, we have not had a chance to present this to the board, but we are looking forward to being able to do so. And then finally, how you yourself can create a green RX. Um, this is a medical student who has common problems. So being a medical student, right, you know that I'm, I'm always anxious, always anxious about my grades, always, you know, I, it starts building, building, I'm not sleeping, um, I'm kind of worrying about things that are going to happen in the future all yeah. the time. Um, so a couple of years ago when I was in medical school, I started hiking and I started going outside. And then I was like, oh wow, I'm actually losing weight, I'm actually sleeping better, I'm feeling really good, so I'm part of the exercise thing. But I went out and I haven't, I mean, I used to suffer from generalized anxiety disorder and would get panic attacks and would oh. wake up in the middle of the night. And, really? Yeah, and I'd be like tachycardic and I'd be sweating in the middle of the night. Huh. And you know, and I, I have not had any of that since I started did, hiking. Did you ever take medicine for general anxiety disorder? Oh yeah, I've taken all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> any of it legal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, when I was in high school, they put me on things like the SSRIs. Yeah. Um, and then as I've gotten older, you know, things just like uh, bad volume. Really? Yeah, just, you know, like if you're having a panic attack, here, take this. Did it work? Eh, you know, for 30 minutes or an hour or whatever. Yeah. So. But the anxiety came back. Anxiety always kind of came back. And what else did you try before, other than the pharmaceuticals and um, before you start hiking? I mean, I kind of tried the meditation thing, and I would do essential oils and do the, you know, the little vaporizer in my room with yeah. the lavender and try yeah. to relax and, you know, deep breathing exercises and meditation, and, you know, that kind of thing in the morning, which is helpful. Uh, it didn't, I mean, I think honestly, I'm like, the hiking has been the best thing ever. So how do you start writing a green prescription? One, ask for a window for your patients. In 1984, Ulrich, um, did a study of uh, post-operative patients who had cholecystectomies for eight years on a ward and f published it in Lancet and found that those patients who had the, a window and a view out from trees instead of at bricks were, uh, had needed less opiate pain medication, Alexia, um, and chose aspirin instead more often, had a shorter length of stay and a better hospital experience. We're still building hospitals without rooms, without windows, but um, that's a mistake. Um, second, stop using microwave plastics yourself. Most of you know that I have a culinary background as well, and the, um, the endocrine disruptors in these things and in uh, synthetic artificial pesticides and herbicides are, as alluded to recently uh, in, in the DDT lecture, uh, both persistent and disruptive. Third, get outside just five minutes a day daily with your device off. 
that's hard for a lot of us. But it's really important because if you're not distracted by the insistent one, two, three of your phone or of the list that you have to make, your brain refocuses so that you're, you're kind of softly fascinated by the beauty of the leaves, by the way the wind is blown, instead of being preoccupied and ruminating on your own problems. For eating an organic herb daily, Josie Behedri, my loved one, um, packed 100 of these, um, which I grew. They're bay leaves and a sprig of rosemary. Uh, Ophelia in Hamlet said that rosemary is for rem remembrance, and actually there have been quite a bit of uh, probably half a dozen studies about the scent of rosemary uh, as an essential oil and its memory performance, memory quality, and speed of memory. Um, in addition, you can put it in a marinade and reduce heterocyclicamine and uh, PAH formation if you grill meats. And bay leaves are some of the highest antioxidant, anti-inflammatory herbs, as almost all herbs are, but they're some of the highest. Um, new bay leaves uh, are not as pungent as older ones. These are older ones that we picked for you. And then finally, um, keep an air cleaning plant inside. Um, these are eight of NASA's 16 plants that they identified in the middle 90s and then um, are having validated through the University of Louisville again that will detoxify the air in your home to remove benzene, trichloroethylene, formaldehyde, and xylene. It's widely known that uh, having plants inside cleans air and does so um, importantly because indoor pollutants are two to five times higher than outdoor pollutants in most communities in America. So um, thank you for your attention and I appreciate it. <laughs> Incidentally, these are on a table outside uh, after David's remarks, uh, which will close the session. Please go and pick one up. Um, there are a hundred of them.